Okay, now let's start. This is chemistry 1411. Practice exam two, which deals with chapter 13. So this is exam two only covers chapter 13, which is equilibria. Equilibria. If you look at the handout that you can take with you into the exam, it literally only has the gas constants. So R is equal to 8.3, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, and R is equal to 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. It only has those two things in the periodic table. So everything else you got to have in your brain, even the formula for Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power of delta n and all that stuff. All right, well, let's get started with question one. It says, when a chemical system is, is at equilibrium, uh, the concentration of the reactants are equal to the concentration of the products. B, the concentration of the reactants and products have reached constant values. Forward and reverse reactions have stopped. The Q has reached a maximum. The Q has reached a minimum. Can anybody tell me what the right answer for this one would, would be? I think you're right. I think the answer is B. Okay, it's phrased a little bit differently than you might think of. You know, a knee jerk reaction for some students is to say, well, the concentration of everything is equal. That's not necessarily true, right? K can be a really large number or it can be a really small number. That means that K can be, or that means that our reaction can be mostly products, it can be mostly reactants. That depends. In C, um, when we have a reaction at equilibrium, it means that the forward and reverse reactions have not stopped. They're still going, but they're proceeding at an equal rate. It's got nothing to do with the reaction quotient. The answer is the concentration of the reactants and products have reached a constant value, right? Let's say we had a reaction where we have, you know, um, 2A giving us, you know, um, 3B or something like that. Well, our K would be equal to B to the power of 3 over A to the power of 2. K is a constant at constant temperature. And so that means that even though there's dynamic equilibrium, the concentrations of both of these would stay constant when we're at equilibrium. All right, let's move on to number two. It says carbon monoxide and chlorine can combine in an equilibrium to pr produce the highly toxic product phosgene. And I told you about phosgene earlier on. It was used, I think, in World War I as a... Um, is a, in the chemical warfare, the Lewis structure of phosgene looks like this. You got COCl2. You probably would have drawn that in general chemistry one. Anyhow, here's the equilibrium. It's shown here for us. Got a nice balanced equation. It tells you the Kc is equal to 248. And then it says, if possible, predict what will happen when the reactants um, and product are combined with the concentrations shown. Well, from this equation, we can derive an expression for a reaction quotient. We already have our Kc. It's given to us right here. But if we want to determine what's going to happen, whether the reaction is going to shift to the right or to the left, in order to answer that, we have to compare Qc. And we're going to compare Qc to Kc. So let's calculate our Qc. The Qc for this reaction is going to be equal to the concentration of phosgene, COCl2, divided by the concentration of carbon monoxide times the concentration of chlorine. So that's going to be equal to 0 0.0992 divided by 0 0.0200 squared, right? Because both of these have the same concentration, so I'm just squaring it. That equals 0 0.0992 divided by 0. Where's my calculator? Uh, here we go. Point zero 0.02. I guess I should be able to do that in my head, shouldn't I? Anyhow, it equals 0 0.000400. Anyhow, so we divide that, and you end up with what? You end up with 248. So that tells us that our QC is exactly equal to our KC. And so which one of these would be the correct answer? Exactly. 
the reaction's at equilibrium. Nothing's ain't nothing gonna happen, right? It's there's gonna be no change in equilibrium since our QC is at equal to KC. That means that the reaction is at equilibrium. Okay, there we go. A little shorthand for you there. All right, let's move on to number three. Number three is not meant to be anything mind-boggling. It's just to know um, or to test our students' ability to come up with a KC expression. We have a beautiful balanced equation here for us. Everything is in the gas phase, so everything can have a concentration. There are no pure liquids. There are no solids. And so our KC, remember that if we have a formula A to the power of A plus B, or sorry, B times B is in equilibrium with C, plus D like that, we can say that our K or our Q is equal to A to the power of little a multiplied by B to the power of lowercase b, C to the power of lowercase c, and concentration of D. Okay, so you need to know that. I'm not going to give this to you as a formula on the exam. You have to have that memorized. But hopefully by now, you've seen me do it enough times that you're like, Mr. Dion, I got this one down, right? I can kill this one, no problem. So you know that Kc is going to be equal to the concentration of the carbon dioxide to the power of 12 times the concentration of the water, the steam, actually, to the power of 6 divided by... Hey, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but your Kc, isn't it supposed to be C and D on top and A and B on bottom? Yeah, it is. I was testing you. Okay, just to making sure. Of 2 times oxygen to the power of 15. All right, there we go. So let's fix this. Mr. Dion needs more sleep. I give up. I'm not getting more, so nothing I can do about it. All right, there we go. Ba, 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 ba. There we go. All right, so if we look over here, we see that it is, which one is it? B is the correct answer. There we go. All right, let's move on from there and take a look at number four. We have a beautiful balanced equation and we're asked to write the KC expression, but you notice that we have zinc that's in the solid phase and we have silver in the solid phase, whereas the cations are in the aqueous phase. We can only include anything that is in the gaseous phase or aqueous phase. And therefore our KC here is gonna be equal to the concentration of the zinc ion divided by the concentration of the silver ion to the power of two. Is that in here? There we go. So it must be E. All right, must be E. Is that what you guys put? I have to look at the chat. Yeah, good. All right, there we go. I know what you're thinking. Boy, I hope the whole exam is these questions. You know, I wish it was all that. No, you have to ask a few questions just to test your ability to do that. Let's take a look at number five. This is like an ACS type question. It says a reaction with an equilibrium constant of 1.5 times 10 to the 21 will consist of what at equilibrium? What would it consist of? Yeah, exactly. It's going to be mostly products. All right, because the K is so darn high. I mean, that's that's one, you know, that's a huge K. That's a big, big number, right? And so since it's the products in the numerator over the reactants in the denominator, that tells us that our concentration of products must be very large, right? Very large, and that this must be very small. And so since the concentration of products is very large, that means that the equilibrium must be hard to the right and only a little bit of reactants anyhow all right let's move on from there that's just a conceptual problem uh let's see here when the following reaction is at equilibrium which of the following relationships is always true well if you start looking i'll just leave this to my students can anybody answer this one let me take you a second to read it Yeah, Brogan, you're you get the, you're in the right path. Yeah, it, it looks like E. I mean, this is it's not a trick question, but it's just to see if my students understand that 
there's no way that you could determine any of these, A, B, C, or D, right? There's no way you could say concentration of something is equal to the concentration of something else. That's got nothing to do with it. You have no K. You don't know anything about K. And so how would you be able to determine any of these? You would not know. All you know is that you could write a KC expression. KC is equal to the concentration of NO squared multiplied by the concentration of chlorine divided by the concentration of NOCl squared. So we can write an expression where we multiply both sides by concentration of NOCl and what NOCl squared rather, and we get the KC times the concentration of NOCl squared is equal to the concentration of NO squared times the concentration of chlorine, right? None of these, there's no way you could make any kind of judgment about any of those without having a K. And so that's just a rearrangement of the formula for the equilibrium constant. All right, I'll give you a second to look at question seven. So we have the reactions of cadmium and the thiosulfate anion. Thiosulfate anion might be one that you don't remember a ton from general chemistry, but this is a thiosulfate. All right. So you could try, you could try drawing the Lewis structure of that. Anyhow, it's just like a sulfate. You just replace one of the oxygens with a sulfur. Anyhow, where the hell was I? Um, we are given these two beautiful equilibrium expressions were given both of the k's and then we're asked to determine the k for this exact reaction here and so could anybody tell me how i would manipulate these two equations that i'm given the k for in order to obtain this as my overall reaction what would i have to do with those what do I have to do with reaction one and re reaction two? It's not K1 over K2. What I'm asking is, what would I have to do with these two equations? Right? How would I manipulate these to obtain this equation? I'm going to add them together, right? So if I add these two equations, if I add those two, my CdS2O3 aqueous is going to cancel out, and I'm going to be left over with this expression right here. So if I'm adding the K1, or sorry, the reaction one and reaction two, if I want to figure out what K3 is, it's going to be equal to what? What, what am I going to do to those two numbers? What would I do to these two numbers if I'm adding these two equations? It's a rule we went over. No, I don't add them, no. When you add two equations, we went over this in class. When you add two equations, you're going to multiply those. Okay, It's going to be equal to the product of K1 and K2. So K3 is going to be equal to 8.3 times 10 to the power of 3 times 2.5 times 10 to the power of 2. When I multiply that spinach out, I get 2.1 times 10 to the power of 6. So I had a whole, I had two slides where I went over the rules, or three slides, two or three slides where I went over the rules of what you do when you manipulate equations. And one of them went over, we had, you know, A gives you B and then B gives you C. And what happens when you added them together? You multiply the two Ks. Okay, so you might have to review those rules, but the answer would be E. So add, when you add reactions, you multiply, multiply Ks. All right. Well, let's move on from there to question eight. A little more about manipulating equations. So this goes back to those same slides. And again, it's also covered in our textbook. There's a whole section about how to manipulate equations. You have this reaction here. Two hydrogen cyanide produces 
hydrogen and C2N2, and they give you the Kp. Kp is equal to 4.00 times 10 to the minus 4. And they're asking you, what's the equilibrium constant for this reaction? So we'll call this Kp prime. Kp prime is equal to what? Well, how did I get from here to here? Could anybody tell me how I manipulated the equation that's highlighted in yellow to get the equation that's highlighted in green? What happened? Yeah, it's reversed. But if I just reverse this equation here, that's not going to give me enough. If I reverse it, okay, let's reverse equation number one. You'd have C2, N2. Oh, I guess it is enough. So you reverse it, C2N2 plus H2 gives you 2HCN gas. Yeah, that works. Okay, so I reverse it. So that means that Kp prime is going to be equal to what? Who could tell me how I'm going to manipulate the K? Exactly. It's the inverse of the Kp. So it's going to be 1 over Kp. So it's 1 over 4 times 10 to the negative 4 with 3 sig figs. When I punch it in my calculator, I get 2.50 times 10 to the third power is equal to my Kp prime. There we go. Kp prime is which one? There we go. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's try number nine. Number nine, I think, is a little more challenging, so I'll give you a second to think about it. I want to manipulate these three equations in order to obtain this equation. I'll give you a minute to look at it. All right. OK, so I see that some people are just typing in the answers, whether it's A, B, C, D, or E. But how would I manipulate the three equations? That's what I'm more interested in. OK, you have to reverse the third equation. Yeah, you have to do that. And what else do you have to do to it? So let's write the first equation, which is 2A in the gaseous phase plus B in the gaseous phase is in equilibrium with A to B in the gaseous phase. So that's our Kp1. We didn't change that. Let's put equation two, which is 2A in the gaseous phase. Man, I got silver on the brain, I guess. There we go. Plus, plus C2 in the gaseous phase, which is in equilibrium with 2AC in the gaseous phase. And that's my Kp2. And then I have to reverse the, the third equation, but not only reverse it, I have to reverse it. Let's reverse and multiply by two. So if I reverse that, then number three becomes 2AC in the gaseous phase plus 2A2B in the gaseous phase, which is in equilibrium with 3 a 2 in the gaseous phase plus 2B in the gaseous phase plus 2C in the gaseous phase. All right. So then Kp3, Kp3 prime is going to be equal to 1 over Kp3. And since I multiplied it by 2, I'm going to put that and I'm going to square it. Right? I use that as a power. So since I multiplied it by 2, 
And watch what happens when you add all three of these together. You can see that the two ACs cancel out. My two A's combine to give me a total of four A's. Um, my A2B, this one cancels. I'm left over with one on this side. And this B cancels. I'm left with one B here. And that gives me 4A in the gaseous phase plus C2 in the gaseous phase plus 1A2B in the gaseous phase is in equilibrium with 3A2 in the gaseous phase plus 1B in the gaseous phase plus 2C in the gaseous phase. So it works. So now how am I going to combine all these to get my new K? My K net, since I'm adding these two, right? Since I'm adding all three of these expressions, I'm going to multiply KP1 by KP2 by 1 over KP3 to the power of 2, which can be simplified to this expression right here. KP1 times KP2 divided by KP3 squared. All right, here we go. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. So you only had to man manipulate one equation. It looks more, looks more difficult than it is. You know, only one equation to manipulate. All right, let's move on to question number 10. It says, consider the equilibrium here. We've got H2 plus Br2 give you 2HBr. Which of the following correctly describes the relationship between Kc and Kp for this reaction? Anybody have an idea about this one? Yeah, Violet, I think you're right. It's A. How do we know that, Violet? That's right. Because in this reaction, you have two moles of gas over here, and you have a total of two moles of ga gas here. Therefore, delta N is equal to zero. So my KP is going to be equal to KC times RT to the power of zero. That means that KP is equal to KC. We went over this in class and we said the only time that KP and KC are going to be identical is when there's no change in the number of moles of gas. All right. So the answer would be um, A. Perfect. Try question 11. It's in a similar vein. It says the equilibrium Kp is uh, 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 at 308 Kelvin for the reaction of nitrogen monoxide with chlorine. What's the value of Kc? We know our formula that Kp, Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power of delta N. If we're looking for Kc, we'll isolate that and we say that Kc is equal to Kp divided by Rt to the power of delta N. So that means that our Kc is equal to 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 0 0.08206 times the temperature, which is 308, 308 Kelvin. And then my delta N What's my delta N? I have two moles of gas on this side and three moles of gas on this side. So delta N is going to be equal to two minus three, which equals minus one. That means my exponent here will be a minus one like that. So we end up with our KC being equal to 6.5 times 10 to the minus four. And I've done all this in my calculator. It ends up being what? 0 0.0396. 0 0.0396, and that equals 0 0.016, which is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, times 10 to the negative 2, and there we have it, C, like that. So just being able to have this formula in your noggin and being able to isolate KC 
and be able to calculate delta n when everything else is given to you. All right, let's move on to number 12. It says 700 Kelvin. <clears throat> We've got a beautiful reaction at equilibrium. It has a Kc of 4.3 times 10 to the positive 6. And we've got the following concentrations. Which of the following? Um, yeah, so these are the concentrations at equilibrium. You have to read the question carefully. It says the reaction has the equilibrium constant of Kc is equal to this, and the following concentrations are present. Which of the following is true? So if we're given the concentrations of all of the components, all we have to do is to calculate Q and compare it to K. So let's write a, an expression for our Q. Our Q is going to be equal to concentration of sulfur trioxide squared divided by the concentration of sulfur dioxide squared times the concentration of oxygen. Like that. Let's go ahead and plug some numbers in. It's a pretty quick one. We've got 10 squared divided by 0 0.10 squared times 0 0.10, so that's 0 0.10 cubed. So that gives you 100 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And of course, there's going to be two sig figs. And when we put that in our calculator, we get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 is equal to our QC. You can see that QC is much less than KC. So if QC is lower than KC, who could tell me which, um, you can see there's two answers that say, Q, I think there is, yeah, QC is less than KC. So it's either C or D. Which way would the reaction proceed if QC is less than KC? Is it going to proceed towards the products or towards the reactants? It's going to go towards the products. Exactly. It's going to have to shift towards the products to make this number higher in order to raise the QC. And so the answer is C. It's going to shift from left to right in order to reach equilibrium. All right, here we go. Moving right along here. Let's try question number 13. It says the equilibrium constant Kp for this beautiful reaction, carbon monoxide plus water gives you carbon dioxide plus hydrogen. The Kp is equal to 0.63 at 986 Kelvin. Um, a rigid cylinder, so that means it's um, the, the uh, volume won't change. Uh, it contains 1.2 atmospheres of carbon monoxide, 0.2 atmospheres of water, 0.3 atmospheres of carbon dioxide, and 0.27 atmospheres of hydrogen. Is it at equilibrium? Well, we have Kp. Let's calculate Qp. Our Qp is going to be equal to the pressure of CO2 times the pressure of hydrogen. Oh, I see what you're saying here. You're partially right, but partially wrong. So I wrote down negative 5. So if you take 100 and you divide it by 1 times 10 to the minus 3, you get 1 times 10 to the positive 5. Okay? I must not have re read my chicken scratch correctly. So QC is still less than KC because KC is 4.3 times 10 to, the neg to 10 to the positive 6. So QC is still less than KC, and the reaction is going to have to shift to the right. Okay, there we go. Let's get back to this one. So we have our QP is equal to the pressure of CO2 multiplied by the pressure of hydrogen divided by the pressure of CO times the pressure of the H2O gas. We're given the pressures of everything, and so we have 0 0.30 times 0 0.27 divided by 1.2 times 0 0.20. And so when you punch all that spinach into your calculator, you get 0 0.34 is your QP. And if our KP, so KP is equal to 0 0.63, you can see that QP is less than KP. And so 
what's our best answer going to be? It says, is the system in equilibrium? The answer is definitely no. So it's either B or C. So we can cross out these ones here. And since the QP is less than the KC, the reaction is going to have to proceed in the forward direction. It's going to have to go towards the right in order to establish equilibrium, right? Because in order for this number to go up to 0.63, I've got to have more products, right? I've got to have a bigger numerator. All right, there we go. Give me a thumbs up if these ones make sense to you thus far. Cha, my students used to say, the last class that I taught face-to-face -face was in Centennial Hall, it was Gen Chem 1, and they'd always say, cha. In fact, some of you might even be people from that class. All right, uh, where was I? Question number 14, nitric oxide and bromine were allowed to react in a sealed container. Okay, good. When equilibrium was reached, the pressure of um, NO is 0.526, the pressure of bromine is 1.59, the pressure of NOBR is 7.68. Calculate KP for the reaction. Nothing more than coming up with an expression for KP. KP is equal to the pressure of the NO BR squared divided by the pressure of the NO squared. <sighs> Multiplied by the pressure of the hydrogen. We plug in some numbers, we got 7.68 squared divided by 0.526. Squared, multiplied by what's the pressure of the hydrogen? 1.59. There we go. So let's check it out here. So we got 7.68 squared. So that's 58. So that's what? 59.0. So the 59.0 divided by 0.526. Oh, 0.52. Son of a gun. 0.526 squared times 1.59, that equals 0 0.440. Am I the only person that punches things incorrectly into their calculator pretty often? All right, we get a KP that's equal to 134. Well, gl I'm glad it's not just me, Katie, because I, I don't like to use those big fancy calculators where you can edit it. You know, I like to use the cheapest calculator I can find. So there we go. So KP is equal to 134. Um, so let's see here. Is that an answer? Yep, there it is right there. There's our KP. All right. Oh, did I put bromine when I meant, or hydrogen when I meant bromine? Yeah. All right. So if you're wondering why I'm so slow, it's the way God made me. No, I'm, I spent the whole night up. My son fell out of his bed and hit his head. And so I was up for hours last night. And yeah, where the heck am I? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Autumn, there's got to be a way to reset it. Yeah, he's okay. But man, oh man, it was, it was crazy. Anyhow, and he's in a bunk bed. It's a long story. Anyhow. And so, yeah, yeah, he's okay. I think he's okay. Anyhow. For you people that have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, I didn't leave myself enough room to solve question 15, so I'm going to let you get started on it. And I'm going to try to come up with a new PDF where I have enough space to solve it because I didn't give myself nearly enough space. It just gave me a second here. It'll probably take me a couple minutes, but I'm a professional. I'll rise above it. You guys know what movie that comes from? We're professionals. We'll rise above it. We're professionals. We'll rise above it. There we go. Just give me a few minutes here and I'll get all set up again. The next questions require a little more space. Okay. 
back in. There we go. Stop presenting here just for a secy here to grab the file for myself. And then I'll have more space to show you the solution. Okay, let's see here. We'll go back here. All right, where are we at? Question 15, right? Okie doke. Okay, question 15. Let me go back to the presentation mode here. Who's enjoying this? Just me? It's kind of relaxing on a Friday. Oh, just as a class to spend some time doing a little practice. Pretty enjoyable. All right. Oh, what, what line did I say from a movie? Oh, uh, we're professionals. We'll rise above it. It's from This is Final Test. All right. Has anybody seen that movie? This is Final Tap. All right. Anyhow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great movie. Anyhow, it's got nothing to do with chemistry. Let's get back on the subject. You know what? If you guys had me as a lecturer in person, you'd find that I'm, I have a little bit different personality in person than I do online, and I like to stop. I'm very intense, you know, when I teach a subject, but sometimes I like to stop and, like, take a break or something and talk to my students about funny things, you know, just things that aren't related to chemistry just for a second. And I have an uncle who worked in the power, at the power company in Nova Scotia for years and years and years. And um, anyhow, he retired. And uh, when he retired, they needed somebody to teach a calculus class. So I'm sure many of you are taking calculus or have taken it. But they needed somebody to teach a calculus class in high school. And so, you know, they asked my uncle because, you know, he was an engineer and he's good at math. And he said, yeah, I'd be willing to teach the class. He said, yeah, I could do that. And so he started teaching when he was over 65. And he started teaching at this high school and he kind of did it as a favor to the school. But, you know, they paid him, obviously. And he said just teaching calculus was really enjoyable. He said the students were really into it, just like you guys, you know, teaching general chemistry too. all of my students are very interested in the subject, especially the people, who, you know, um, you know, uh, want to take it during a pandemic. You got to be intense. But anyhow, uh, he said that he was teaching. A, they, they said, can you teach a remedial class? You know, like basic math. And he said, ugh. I don't really want to do that. Anyhow, so he started teaching this basic math class, and he said, oh, boy. He said, you can't even get them on the subject of math. He said, they never want to talk about math. He said, one day I brought up the subject of pi, and the next class, a bunch of them had baked pies and brought them in because he said, oh, we're talking about pi, so we'll just bake a pie. Anyhow, that's as far away as I'm going to get away from the practice exam. Anyhow, I think it's funny. All right. Well, let's... Uh, Let's get into question 15. Who's got the whole thing done? Anyone while I was talking? No? Okay. Well, let's get to it here. Uh, let's see. We've got a mixture of 0 0.4, 0 0.5 moles of carbon monoxide and 0.4 moles of bromine in a rigid one liter container. That makes it easy, right? C calculation for the, for the concentration is very simple. Divide by one. Excuse me. Then you let the system come to equilibrium. At equilibrium, they tell you the concentration of COBr2, and they ask you to calculate the Kc. I agree with you, Stephen. This one isn't bad, but let's give it the old college try here. Um, and let's start by writing down what we know. We have our reaction. I'm going to write it out a little bigger here. So I've got carbon monoxide plus bromine is in equilibrium with COBr2 in the gaseous phase. Initially, what are we starting out with? It said that we're starting out with 0 0.50 moles of carbon monoxide. Now, I could just write 0 0.50 and then divide it by one, but I'm going to guess 
that all of you know what the answer is when you divide by one, that you would end up with 0 0.500 molar of carbon monoxide. And we've got 0.4 moles of bromine in one liter. So we're gonna start it with 0 0.400 moles, or sorry, molar of bromine. We have no COBr2. Then we're gonna have a change, right? Since we only have reactants and we have no products, the reaction is definitely gonna shift towards the right. So that means we're gonna lose X here, we're gonna lose X here, and we're gonna gain X over here. The reason I don't have to put a one or, a, or sorry, a two or a three X or anything like that is because the stoichiometric coefficient of everything is one. So I can just use the minus X and the plus X. Now for my equilibrium, here I have 0 0.500 molar minus X, here I have 0 0.400 molar minus X, and here I have X. Now they've told us that when we're at equilibrium, when we're here, that the concentration of COBr2, our X is equal to 0 0.233 molar. So like Stephen said, all we have to do is take X and plug it into these two expressions to figure out the concentration of CO, carbon monoxide at equilibrium, and bromine at equilibrium. So if I take 0 0.500 and I subtract 0.233, I end up with 0 0.267 molar. And when I take 0.4 and I subtract 0 0.233, I end up with 0 0.167 molar. And here I have 0 0.233 molar. No quadratics to solve, none of that business, no square roots to take or anything like that. Now we'll just write an expression for Kc. Kc is equal to the concentration of our CO, Br2, divided by the concentration of CO times the concentration of bromine, plug in some numbers, we get 0 0.233 divided by 0 0.267 multiplied by 0 0.167. When we do that, let me double check my math here. So 0 0.233 divided by 0 0.267 times 0 0.167. I got, what do I have? I need a new prescription so bad. 5.22, so I got Kc is equal to 5.22. Is that an answer? 5.23. Hot diggity darn. Close enough. Okay. 5.23. Okay. If you're wondering, Mr. Dion, and probably by now you're not wondering this, are you going to give me 5.21, 5.22, 5. No. No. I'm not going to do that. Okay. That's called being a jerk. Okay. They didn't hire me to be a jerk. They taught me to teach the content. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. I'd say as far as ice table goes, it's probably one of the less complex type problems. All right, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Allison. Perfect, thanks, Joel. Great. Excuse me. Well, let's move on and give number 16 a try. This one involves, this is gonna involve an ice table. It says the equilibrium constant, Kc, for this beautiful reaction, PCl3 plus chlorine gives you PCl5. Kc is 49 to 230 degrees Celsius. If you start it with this many moles of PCl3 and chlorine in a one liter reaction vessel, again, I love it when they give us the one liter reaction vessel because we don't have to do any difficult math to calculate concentration. What's the concentration of PCl3 when its uh, equilibrium has been established? Let's write down what we know, okay? And I realize that at this point, I'm dealing with, you know, some people in the class might be able to solve this in, in 30 seconds, okay? And if you can just do this on the back of a napkin very quickly and solve it, there's no problem with that. I don't have any problem with that. But as your instructor, I like to take, I'm gonna take my time and kind of go through it. So if you wanna keep moving on the practice exam, feel free. Let's write down what we know. We got PCL3 plus Cl2, write down our phases of matter, produces PCL5. We know that initially we started with 0 0.70 moles of both of the reactants, we're in one liter, so 0 0.70 divided by one gives you 0 0.70 molar and 0 0.70 molar of both of those. We're starting it with zero PCL5, and our change is gonna be what? The reaction has to shift towards the products because we don't have any products. And we have a KC, so that means there has to be some products. So we're going to lose X on this side, lose X here, and we're gonna gain X over here. Notice that again, it's not two X or three X or anything like that, it's just, you're losing one X and you're gaining one X because the stoichiometric coefficients of all of these are one, okay? Let's write down what we have at equilibrium. 
we've got 0 0.70 um, minus x, 0 0.70 minus x, and we've got x. Let's plug some numbers in. And we've got, um, what's our KC? Where was it? 49. Okay, so we get KC, which is equal to, do I need to write up the whole equal root expression every time? Probably not. I'm going to just do it anyhow. So KC is equal to this divided by this. I'm sure you're all faster than me at this by now. But anyhow, we got 49 is equal to x divided by 0 0.70 minus x squared, right? Because there's two of these. So we're going to have to solve a quadratic. Why did I put x squared? I don't know in my numerator. All right. So I simplified that to 49 is equal to x over 0 0.49. Subtract 1.4x plus x squared. So when you multiply all that spinach out, you get 24.0 minus 68.6. X plus 49x squared is equal to x, which equals 24.0. Subtract 69.6x plus 49x squared is equal to zero. Then you need to solve the quadratic. You can either solve the quadratic or you can grab a fancy calculator. Give me a sec. Mine's in my backpack. All right. My TI-36 Pro. Let's see here. So grab my calculator. Into the polynomial function. And let's see. Our A is 49. Our B is, what is it? Negative 69.6. And our C is 24. Put that in, and we get that our X is equal to, uh, what is it? 0 0.589. 0 0.589. Nope, not 5985. Man, I'm tired. 589 molar. Anyhow, there we go. What was the question? What's the concentration of PCL3? So if we want to know the concentration of PCL3, concentration of PCL3 is going to be equal to 0 0.70, subtract 0 0.589, and we take that. I should be able to do that in my head. 0.7, subtract 0.589. Son of a gun. Nine. I end up with 0 0.11 molar. All right, is that up there? Yep. Okay, good. What do you think of that one? Uh, let's see, what did these guys say? Regarding the poly function, blah, 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 we use x1 as the answer and not x2. No, 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 Autumn. That's not how you solve a quadratic, right? When we use the quadratic formula, okay, when we solve the quadratic formula, which is x, x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Okay, when we solve the quadratic, since we have plus and minus, we end up with a positive answer and a negative answer. You take the positive answer. That's the answer, okay? You just take the positive answer. Okay, the negative answer is not of any concern to us. So whether it's x1 or x2, your calculator doesn't matter. Whichever one is the positive answer, that's the right one. Leave the negative one behind. Does that help? Okay, well, any okay, good, good. I'm glad it helps. All right. Let's see, number 17. 17. Um you're asking me, could we take the square root of both sides? I suppose anything's possible, but then you'd be working with the square root of x. The only time that that whole taking the square root of both sides works really well is if this was squared, 
right? Then you take seven is equal to X over 0 0.70 minus X, right? So that's the only time you're really gonna use that. All right, sorry. Bah, 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 bah. When I plug it in the program, I got two positive answers. Should You shouldn't get two positive answers. I'm gonna check mine. Oh shit, I cleared it out. Maybe I didn't, let me go back in here. Bah, bah, bah. Solve. Well, that's strange. Let me let me look into that, Luke. Let me look into that. Um, I'm gonna make a note of it right here. Uh, all right. 